Thanks. Look, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to speak to the group. Um, uh, as um, as explained, I'm based in Melbourne in Australia. We we do uh, extensive global analysis, uh, and I'm going to give you something which is a a very brief walkthrough of of how we see uh, how we do our work very briefly, but also um, how we look at the the long term and what what the major issues uh, that we see out there in the um, in the global market. Firstly. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure to what extent people are aware of fundamental analysis uh, in, in the dairy market. So I'll start with a with a very quick overview of the the sorts of things we think about when we look at um, at global markets. Naturally, we start with milk production, um, and we we have a in most of the major developed uh, producing nations there is a fluid milk offtake of milk. Which, which then leaves manufacturing milk. Um, the value of milk is determined by the trade in manufacturing milk and what products are derived from that. Um, and I guess what I want to quickly walk through, what are the, what are the main issues when we look at uh, analysis from, from our perspective? One of the biggest, um, one of the biggest issues that uh, manufacturers deal with is, is how to use their milk across a year. And so the product mix decisions they make um, uh, in terms of uh, making uh, across a number of commodity products, uh, there are decisions that are based on available capacity, the returns from different products, uh, and the seasonality of, of, of milk flows and what time of year they're in give rise to uh, the production of commodities that, that come from their business. Then when we step through the rest of what we call the balance sheet, um, the complications get a little bit, uh, little bit murkier. Because what we see uh, naturally, there's there's an opening stock, there's imports in most regions, uh, there's a domestic offtake uh, into the marketplace, uh, exports leaving a closing stock. Um, the the number of difficult issues that that are there when you when you look at this um, through a balance sheet is compounded by the by the fact that when you look at this, you look at each major region by commodity, you've got a very complicated marketplace. Um, domestic usage, which is the largest offtake of milk in the globe, that is when you look at the, and I'll show you, I'll walk through some of this shortly, but the domestic markets for cheese um, in Europe and the US are the largest consumers of milk in the global market. Uh, and there's a number of variables that impact uh, the consumption of those products, um, leaving aside what's left after that domestic use is what we call export availability. It is essentially the trade in those export markets and the availability of that product that determines the value of milk and pretty much values all milk in the supply chains around those developed regions. Um, so it is a very complicated um, marketplace. What, what our business has done um, has built a, uh, a platform of analysis to analyze this across the major exporting regions and into those global markets. Um, and that platform allows that to be to be uh, simulated over time uh, in an outlook, so that we are essentially looking at the dynamics that impact all of those variables through those balance sheets across the regions uh, and across the dairy commodities. And those commodities being skim milk powder, whole milk powder, butterfat, cheese, and the whey products as derivatives. So the global marketplace, from a developed sense, is is very complicated. One way that we have developed um, to to look at this from a from a high level um, is, is to consider the different types of supply chains through that global market. Uh, and we have got major exporters and you can see I've identified who they are there and how much milk production uh, comes through those, through those supply chains. Um, there are minor exporters, there are large producing importers. So we're talking about China and now the UK separate from the EU, uh, Mexico, Brazil, Russia. Um, they are very important players in consuming trade, but they also have very large domestic production of their own. So they are essentially a balancing um, uh, market. And then the import dependent regions, which are largely the developing regions of the world, which are uh, absolutely reliant on, um, on imported products. So this is a view, and when we look forward to 2030, we've got to think about, you know, where have we come from and what sort of change have we seen in the last eight to 10 years or so before we start thinking about where we might go for the next 10? So when we look at 2012, 
that's the change to 2020. Um, not so profound. There's there's been some big changes, but the numbers, if you if I flick between them, the numbers do change quite a bit. Let me make it simpler. In the period from 2012 to 2020, and 2012 is when we started to add up um, this global market, we saw a number of simple things happen. We saw a tremendous expansion in Europe when they removed their quotas. Uh, the US grew at a very steady rate over time. And of course, not, not forgetting India, which, had, which has had a major expansion uh, in domestic production, but not so much involvement in trade. In the middle, global dairy trade increased by 27 billion litres. And when you look at the size of that increase versus the size of total production we have on the left-hand side, it's not a very big volume that's been, that's been increased in, in global trade. As we look at the marketplace, we think that value is determined by uh, a number of very important things. So right out on the right-hand side on that chart, uh, values of commodities and the value of global milk uh, tends to be most determined by the fluctuating availability of exports from the major producers. So the supply side of the dairy market is the biggest driver of value. And so that are the, they are the fluctuations in milk production and the availability of exports after taking their domestic use, including fluid milk, but also the, the domestic consumption of product. Um, the, second, the second important driver, much lower down the scale, is the import gap in those producing importers. And we all talk about China and how much demand China might have, how much it's had and how that's changed over time and where it might go in the future. Uh, that is one of the drivers, but a very much a lesser influence on, on milk values. But China's um, consumption at home and, and the import gap is a critical variable, just as we see in Mexico and as we see in the future in, in the UK. Um, and then lastly, but no least, the, the import dependent regions, which just tick along, steadily growing over time. They grow in a similar vein to GDP, um, but there are different dynamics in, across those regions. And so when, we, when we're thinking about what does the world look like in 10 years' time, We've got these three or four different layers of supply chain to look at and, and contemplate what might change those dynamics across those, those groups of players. Well, the dairy value chain, I'm sure you've all seen different views of this. Uh, we represent it like this. Uh, and the different, as I've explained, the different parts of that value chain are different uh, components to think about when we're looking at change over time. So in the, in the next decade, I'll just layer on the, uh, the key factors which we believe will shape that trade balance over time and shape the, the value of commodities. And so let's just start. I mean, essentially, we think there is a, uh, a slow growth in milk supply coming from uh, major producers such as New Zealand, European Union, Latin America, for different reasons. New Zealand has a lot of constraints on the expansion of that industry, um, mostly to do with the community's acceptance of dairying and the environmental impacts uh, on, on farming, but also the challenges facing dairy enterprises in New Zealand, particularly around uh, the expansion, um, given there are, the, the industry has got high debt, it's got high land values, uh, and so the capacity to grow at a strong rate in the future, uh, even further, is limited. The European Union is running up against environmental limits. Uh, it's also constrained by the way in which dairy farmers can respond to volatile conditions. Um, we're moving down the supply chain. Of course, I mentioned China. China ha has broadened its dairy demand and it is certainly a key influence. And over time, China's demand or its import gap will change. It has changed profoundly in the last 10 years and will continue to develop uh, you know, the role for dairy imports, and I'm sure we'll get some questions on that. But that, as we see, um, will depend on China's internal demand and what it's, what, it's, um, what it's driven by. That is largely a fresh dairy market, but it has a key role for ingredients. The competitiveness of imported ingredients uh, is, a key, uh, is a key issue. I've described those developing world demographics, um, steady growth in dairy consumption uh, with rising incomes, rising affordability, improving lifestyles, and importantly, improving access to refrigeration in their homes uh, is a key driver of the types of dairy consumption uh, 
that are going to exist. And the last thing at the top in green, and, and as it shows, the green ones are things that tend to grow, grow value. So they're the positive factors over time. There've been lots of free trade agreements and uh, bilateral agreements agreed in the last decade. The benefits of those agreements will continue to flow over time. So they don't just come at once, they steadily build over time. So we have a lot of these in stream, which will continue to flow and benefit the, um, the, both the consumers in, in uh, destination markets, as well as the producers. Now in the bottom half, uh, there are some things which, which are negative to some extent, because what I'm talking about is the global balance. So, um, and, and the impact on product value over time. We think the US is probably the largest potential growth engine in dairy markets. So the growth rate of the US, and obviously as that growth continues, more milk coming onto the market will threaten product values, uh, threaten the oversupply of product values. The balance of India's dairy market, a great mystery to us all outside of India, just what will be over time, the growth of India, the growth of domestic market and the role that exports might play or imports might play uh, and how that spills onto the world market. Um, I'll talk about the low price environment for oil. One of the hangovers from COVID for, uh, for many years will be the fact that we have an oversupplied, a structurally oversupplied oil market. That impacts the dairy uh, sector in, in a number of ways. Not only does it impact if we have low oil prices, we have low feed costs, we have easier production margins for farmers. We also have several dairy markets which are impacted by lower oil revenues and that gradually impacts the, the spending available in those markets. Um, I noticed there's a question about this, I'll, I'll mention it briefly, but dairy alternatives in synthetics um, remove some of the demand for cow's milk. Uh, and we've only seen, we're only seeing the early days of that, I think, but over time, you know, that might reduce the available role for, uh, for dairy solids. And this multipolar world where trade might be disrupted by um, moves for self-sufficiency and nationalisation. I think that is a strong force we've only just seen the start of. But uh, as countries look to look after their own people and feed themselves. Now, there are two that I've, I would say we, we don't know which way they'll go. But living with COVID, uh, COVID has changed the channel demand for dairy products, just how people consume products. Uh, and the structure of demand between retail, uh, eating at home and uh, eating out, et cetera, will, uh, will continue to evolve, as well as the impact of changing consumer preferences. So the affordability of products, um, not only by what incomes people have, but also has their changes and their influences occur over time. So there's lots to talk about here. On this page, I've ho hopefully tried to um, uh, break these down into things which I think are really game changers that might evolve over time. Um, so things that might have a, a, a greater impact, money is going to be cheap for a long time. And so regional farm expansion where capital is readily accessible and dairy growth can occur on farm is something to look for. So I think the US is a primary target there, but there'll be other new horizons where we'll see farms develop with, uh, with greater degree of funding. I would look to Eastern Europe, I would look to some of the CIS, uh, some parts of South America where the environment might be more suitable. Um, so where, where that occurs, I think is potentially gonna change the supply side. Low cost oil, uh, it's a very fragile piece in the oil market. So just how that holds uh, will be interesting to watch. Uh, and I think the US has a fat problem. I'm not talking about uh, diet. I'm not talking about um, the obesity challenge. The US overproduces dairy fat. It has a genetic um, uh, growth in, in cow production or fat, and it has a um, essentially a challenge in, in consuming that fat in its own market. So uh, that's something we're seeing right now, for sure, in the US market with a very weak market, but that's, that's coming. Uh, that, that's a growing problem. Right-hand side on the demand side, uh, demand for alternatives and synthetics could take off quite quickly. Um, and the milk use and self-sufficiency levels in China. So that can be a big swing factor. So those things I think are game changers. We have a number of things which are slow burns. They, they don't change very much. They change steadily over time. So as I said earlier, the growth in New Zealand and EU would be quite slow. Uh, Latin American instability, it's been there for a long time. Everyone's been talking about the great opportunity for Brazil uh, for at least the last decade, nothing's happened. 
So that, that's something that probably sits there. And again, on the demand side, those developing markets, evolving consumer preferences, these things happen slowly over time, uh, not to be dismissed, but they are very important in the world balance. Then a whole lot of wild cards, volatility of feed prices, India's market balance, the extent to which the US industry can continue to exist with a very old parochial set of regulations which inhibit innovation uh, and limit the ability for the industry to really capitalize on will, you know, the opportunities in, in the uh, export markets. Um, that's a big challenge. I think the industry really hasn't started to grapple with that. It's very protectionist of those things and it's politically charged. Uh, the strength of the green agenda, uh, just how much change that might put. Uh, and I know, for instance, looking at Europe and how much of a constraint they put on production through that. On the right-hand side, uh, how COVID is uh, and its following recession are altering markets. Um, will Russia come back from the cold? Uh, and whether or not we see global trade policy uh, move into a more bilateral or we go unilateral with, with a re-embracing of, of the WTO. I think those things can, can change shape. They're hard to predict. Um, we don't just look at the numbers when we do our work. We look at a, uh, a whole lot of, I guess, factors which are important in determining how the world will operate and what some of the changes are over time. So we have a, we have a monitoring of what we call megatrends. Uh, and so these five things around this chart are quite important because we see a great deal of change in the way consumers behave. Uh, the world has a great deal of um, complex volatility and, and, and those dimensions there are, are part of that. Um, technology is ever advancing and uh, it not only shapes the way in which consumers behave, but also the way in which we uh, will produce milk and the way in which milk will be processed. Uh, there are always evolving value chain models uh, in ways that which participants will uh, capture value in supply chains um, uh, and that, that affects the entire supply chain. And then the, uh, the more from less, the limited resources and capacities that, that impact over time. So these things are, are, are quite immense. We could have a separate session on this altogether to, to talk about these. Um, the only thing I would add is the more interesting things between these different uh, megatrends are the way they intersect and the way in which technologies are influencing consumers, uh, the way technology impacts the way sustainability might be um, harnessed over time. Uh, Etc. I mean, there are many ways in which we could look at this, and that I'm, I'm happy to talk about that in uh, in the question session. Um, looking at the other aspect of this is just how the world behaves over time, and so one of the other things I'd, I'd suggest um, is relevant here, and this is I've adapted from a, a World Economic Forum uh, framework which came out a few years ago, is to look at where the the approach we take as a as a global industry, and so what I've what I put here are, are Two dimensions. Uh, one looks at the extent to which markets are connected or the extent to which we collaborate in terms of trade. Uh, and secondly, what will drive demand? Will it be drive, driven to the extent to which it's driven by health and wellness and sustainability priorities? And so what the uh, WEF put together are four scenarios about behaviour. Um, and they deal with the way in which we might, the extent to which we will collaborate the extent we'll work together as countries uh, and what will drive the shape of demand and how countries will behave in that, in that future order. This is very interesting stuff. When we put together our long view, which is coming in the next few months, uh, we will shape this into the dairy world and describe how this might look as we, as we work forward. Um, and lastly, I'd leave this by saying, when we think about what will drive consumption and the extent to which we'll, we'll observe sustainability, the extent to which countries work together, just think about where we've been. We think a few years ago, we were probably sitting about here in that grid, slightly to the left, uh, looking at re, you know efficient resource consumption. The environment's a bit of a challenge. We're not really doing a good job on that. After COVID and Trump, or Trump and COVID, we have probably slipped down here a bit. Uh, we've fractioned, the world has become a little bit more polarised, a little bit more fragmented, a little bit thinking of our own uh, it'll be very interesting to see how the world shapes after we, um, we move from this. And as we go through the COVID phase, as America digests the post-Trump environment, just how the world reshapes and, and, and deals with these sorts of changes. Lastly, to the business end of this, what does 2030 look like? And I thought 
we have a um, we have a lot of gradual or profound changes. So the future might be made up of, of a combination of those things. But certainly as a baseline, milk growth is going to be constrained. We'll certainly see strong demand growth. And what that does is it constructs a scenario that sees a rising milk value over time. Uh, it's very hard to get a scenario that doesn't involve the milk value rising at as, as it has done, but it doesn't look like a steady line. We've got a shape of that line out there. There'll be volatility for, sure, for you know, it's sure the volatility will occur just as has as done in the past around that band as I've shown on the on the right hand side. So a steadily value, steadily rising commodity value, um, lots of volatility. Our process is to build plausible assumptions that let people assess the risks of different changes coming over time. Um, but that's look, that's a quick tour of how we see the world and how we'll how we'll do this exercise. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you uh, and wrap up my session.